um, am on antibiotics for the next five days, and then we have against biotics. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> they know what they did. So yeah, what we're going to talk about, you know, pushing back on clients, I think in general, giving clients feedback to their suggestions that might not be in line with what our suggestions or recommendations would be. If I could give a little background on where this topic kind of came from for me. Yeah. I was uh, doing a workshop, teaching a class with some folks last week, and it was all internal. They all worked for the same company. We were talking about, well, lots of things, but, and they're, we're talking about UX design. Uh, specifically, and these were not trained, experienced designers, but they're kind of transitioning into that role. And they've had a lot of issues in the past, and they're and they're good. They've got good instincts, and they've had issues in the past pushing back on clients. Clients want an interaction to be a certain way in a design, in their mm. web-based software, and these guys would push back, and the clients would basically railroad them and say, "No, it has to be this way." And they didn't have any backup if you will. They didn't have a leg to stand on in their arguments. The clients, you mean? Uh, yeah, my, my, my participants, my students to, the, to their clients. And one of them asked, you know, point blank in the, in the training, like, how, what are some techniques? How do you do that effectively? Mm -hmm. It was a really good question. And when you're asking it from a position of inexperience, you're, you're in, for lack of a better word, a weak position to argue, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's how they felt like they didn't have the, the confidence and the, uh, the background to have, to put up a good argument, even though what they were saying they felt was right. And from what they told me, they were valid arguments, mm -hmm. but the client just still felt, they, the client still kind of bullied them into what they wanted, right or wrong. And right. in most cases, it sounds wrong. So I thought that'd be a good topic for us to expound upon some techniques, maybe share some stories on when we've been in those positions and things like that. Well, what about you? So, and honestly, I had a hard time coming up with some concrete examples. Like one that I, I told them I was on a project a few years ago is an interaction design project. And one of the other topics I was teaching this class was about standards and using uh, pattern libraries and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And I was doing this project and I was doing interaction design and a client or someone on the client's team was pushing back on some, insig not insignificant, but some widget control that I had used. I said, well, why didn't you use, why'd you use that one? Or basically questioning it. And it was funny because it was something from their pattern library. Like they actually had an established pattern library. <laughs> I'm like, right. this is something from your style guide. If you don't like this, then let's, that's a different conversation. But in general, my general feedback was, you know, these things can be argued or discussed in a way that makes it objective. So a lot of the feedback from clients feels like it's subjective. It's based on their own experiences with whatever software they happen to use, right. um, whatever they have in their head. Or I use this software at home and I like it, so why don't you do something like that? So I, I talked to them about things like, you know, obviously user testing, you know, understanding what the actual target users want to use and what their other tools that they use do and mm -hmm. try to match those expectations and those patterns. And if that's not available, and, and these guys did talk, we have talked extensively about their lack of customer interaction, but doing a, a new usability test with customers. And if that's not possible, then you look at just basic standards, look at, you know, basic heuristics, you know, things that are more objective and try to like frame the conversation about, well, this is the problem we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. It's not a preferential thing. This is why this solution we think is better based on X, Y, and Z. So it's less about, I think this, you think that, and try to remove the subjectivity from the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's always a good point. It's almost as if uh, a really handy decision tree would be helpful. Uh, <laughs> so they can you know, <laughs> card and say, you know, okay, this situation is okay, this and then. <laughs> so one of the things that can sometimes come up is, you know, I want to use this widget, or I think we should use this transition or this interaction or, or whatever the, the small thing is, that sometimes the issue they're having is not really about that. That's just what they've decided to focus on and, and pick on because they either can't articulate or don't think they should articulate what's really on their mind. And I think that that is 
for me, a really good starting point of, is this really about what they're talking about? Right. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my first pass of to what extent does this need to be addressed? And then after that, if it really is, that's the issue, then I think you're right. It's going down and, and trying to make it as objective a conversation as possible. My next step would be to not really make any comments, but start asking questions in hopes that they talk themselves out of it. The classic interviewing strategy. What led you to choose that? Or right. what led you down that path? Or how did Tell you- Tell me more that? about your thought process. Right. If there was one. Because I think a lot of times, if you can get people, especially verbally, not over email, but I think these are these are conversations that you need to have a little more high fidelity with. If you can get them to verbalize it, they hear it sometimes, not always. Right. And then they're like, oh, okay, no, 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 I, you know, and they, they will either back down a little bit or back down completely. But if they're still pushing, I think we then have another decision point of, okay, can we let this go? Right. Right. What's, what do I think is going to be the impact if we just let, let them have their way? Right. And actually that's where our conversation led as well. Like at some point you have to make that decision as a consultant or just a client, mm -hmm. you know, is this something, how hard do we want to fight for this? Right. Is this going to break the app? What is the risk involved? Right. Um, and and think, then communicating what we think that risk is. Right. Because it's like, okay, if we do this, here are what the risks are, especially if we're not going to go and do any testing afterwards or, or before to see what the impact is going to be. Here's the risk. Are you signing off on that risk? Right. And it might be something that they're like, yeah, we're, we're willing to sign off on that. It, like the example that these folks were, were telling me about was in this particular case, the actual users, they knew that they were in Microsoft Office all day long. They're using Excel and Word. And so they had an interaction that kind of modeled the Microsoft pattern and the client didn't want to for whatever reason. I didn't remember the details. And so their reasoning was, well, we want to stick true to what customers are used to and the risk was, you know, customers might have more trouble learning their application and, you know, following through on the critical tasks. Explaining risk is a great tactic as well. Um, and I think some people, and I know you've run into these folks as well, you have clients and they just, lack of a better word, they're stubborn or, you know, they just think they know. They've yeah. been around the block. They've been working on a product for 20 years. Right. Whatever reasons, you know, and I was, I was in the field 20 years ago. This is how we did it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell a, a quick anecdote related to this. I was working on a project and the stakeholder was really against user testing, doing research, not even usability testing, just going out and doing interviews. They already knew what their journey was like and blah, blah, blah. We went out and did it anyway, but even though he was against it, we convinced them to let us go out and we came back and we were doing a readout and we had 20 some odd people in the room, including people that actually talked to customers, like support people. Right. Work for this executive and we're going through it and he was questioning our findings saying like he knew better like this wasn't accurate information and then actually some people one person in particular stood up at the workshop and said no they're right like this is actually what happens and basically shut him up and this is like a support lead or something to a director or some odd level right. person right. and that that's what so it took for that person for the to listen lead to do their job Right. I mean, they took courage quietly and so good on them. Yeah. It was very good. And yeah, definitely I thank them after the class, after the workshop, like that took courage because it was her boss's 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 boss, whatever. Right. And that's what it took for that, that stakeholder, that executive to kind of listen to us and take a different view. Like none of the things that we said, we could show videos, we could talk about quotes. It was just this wall we kept running up against Yeah. of, of acceptance of research. And I was a little bit off, off topic, but it reminded me of that story. Like it sometimes it's hard to know how to break through and how to make a convincing argument. And sometimes it's has to be one of your own. Sometimes it has to be an outsider. I've seen the other way, exactly the same way. They don't listen to their employees, but they listen to an outside consultant. Yeah. And, and in some cases your, your role then switches to being in some respects, an advocate for the internal people who are, who really know what's going on. Yeah. And like, no, no, no. They, they know like in your, your scenario, the support person was like, no, no, no. 
our consultants know what they're talking about. And so right. Our cases is like, no, 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 your employees know what they're talking about. Listen to them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's something that I'll say that I don't run into a lot, but yeah, it continues to surprise me the level to which people will, and it shouldn't, but it does the level to which people will hold on to their ideas, even in the face of here's all this data that right. is not where you're going. Or here's, here is recommendations from people we've hired as experts. Right. Yeah. To do whatever. And yet there's still not that trust. And, but to your point, I haven't run into it a ton either. Like when this person asked the question, it, took me a minute to really think of some relevant stories or anecdotes that I'd run into. Um, well, I, I, I've got one that I'm, I'm one person removed from, but it, I think it's still relevant in that the CEO who has really thought this through hmm. and is presented with data that says, otherwise he's forceful enough that, you know, the, the people who are presenting the data are like, well, all right, we'll try it your way. So eventually this company gets acquired and the acquiring company starts to integrate the company that they bought the software into their product. And that was a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago that that process started. And I heard recently that they're shutting it all down now because it is um, a shit show <laughs> mm. to use the colloquial. Mm -hmm. It was a turned out to be a bad buy. And it probably wouldn't have been such a bad buy if the CEO had listened to his employees who he had hired to be experts in these areas. Like I said, it surprises me and, and also it, it doesn't surprise me. Which is yeah. not to say we're always right. No. And we talked absolutely. about this maybe yeah. in another podcast or a topic for a potential future one is just having some humility when you are a UX or service designer and like, going to the objective research or something. It's not just about what I think is better. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that I did this a little bit when I first started, but doing the whole my way or the highway kind of thing probably took me a few years to get fully out of that mode. But even within the first couple of years of my career, I could see the people who were really holding like the UX people who are really holding on to my way or the highway were really getting nowhere. To me, it isn't my way or the highway. That's not even the question. What is best for this context? The context being here are the people we're impacting. Here's the outcome we want to achieve. What is the best thing? And this goes back to our, it depends conversation of you're constantly having to, to weigh and reweigh these different components of a project, things are jockeying for for position to be the most important thing as you go through the project. And it's a part of our work that I think most people, when they come into this kind of stuff, are not prepared for, mm -hmm. unless they're transitioning to UX from a professional job that they've, they've had to deal with the whole politicking and negotiating stuff. Yeah, I think how I learned early on in my career was just being wrong. <laughs> like I'd have ideas, and again, this is ages ago where we didn't have as much training or, you know, right. available knowledge transfer. And I present ideas and other people, other designers, developers, whoever I was working with, have better ideas. And I yeah. totally recognize that. I'm like, wow, that's, that is a better idea. Let's, you should be doing this. <laughs> yeah. And well, I mean, yeah. yeah. You do that enough. You, you, you kind of realize, all right, I'm going to come up with an idea and mm -hmm. I'm open to other ideas because other ideas might be better. And what's the point in holding on to an idea just to be right if it's not the best idea? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I'm very glad that long ago I gave up on the desire to be right about things. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like I, I am wrong about things a lot, Yeah, but I'm wrong about them in, in the, the playground of our, research and design process where I can say, I think it's this, and then I can go and validate that or gather more information in general about it and be like, Hmm, maybe not so much that, but you know, to your point, I remember years ago, we were, we were, you and I were on a call uh -huh. 
with a with a client and uh we we keep picking on greg um, <laughs> I didn't realize that's where you're going. Oh, Greg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I, I don't even remember what it was about, but I remember that feeling when Greg said something. What if we just did this? And Greg, for the context of the viewers at home, and back-end developer on the project, Matt and I were the the shiny UX stars. Greg, Greg was the rock. Greg is awesome. Yeah. He said, what if we do it this way? And And I remember thinking, oh, that is, that's a really good idea. We should do it that way. He's right. Now I, I want the whole team to, I know it's not always practical, but I want the whole team to be involved in, in the research and the design stuff. Right. Uh, because these good ideas come from everywhere. You know? and, well, and that goes back to one of our, not, uh, we are the experts, but we also don't have all the answers. And it goes back to one of our tenants of design as a team sport. Right. And you shouldn't do it solo. It's dangerous right. to do it yeah. solo. Um, where, you know, you and I partner up on a lot of stuff, but it's not just having the UX mind involved. It's also having developers or mm -hmm. stakeholders, whoever, content folks, marketing, whoever. As far as, you know, how do you deal with it? Is the issue even about the issue that's being talked about? If it is, deal with it. If it's not, figure out what that issue is. And then is, you know, is there any way to get the person who's being intransigent to talk themselves out of it. And if it's not, as you said, you know, let's, let's make this objective. Let's, let's go gather some information. Let's go gather what best practices are around this. And then if they still won't budge, I think we all need to have where our point where, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to use words like fight and, and things like that, but we're going to let it go and let just let it happen the, the way they want we have to take into account are we setting that up for future behavior like this do we need to meet with this person individually or do we need to have a group session where hopefully mm -hmm. a support person stands up and says matt wallens knows what he's talking about i'm not always a big fan of the of the do it out in the open thing because i think people can get embarrassed and they hold on to their idea even more yep but you know sometimes it works out yeah and I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the person writing the check gets the final call in a lot of cases, yeah. but as a consultant or anytime you're on the other side, you're at least can document things. Mm -hmm. So down the road, if it blows up in your face, you can say something or have something to say, oh yeah, we, we talked about that and we ended up going in this direction, not to place blame, but more of a cover. And again, as you said, it's, it might not even be an issue. It might be a non-issue that no one even notices or cares about. And then you just move on. And that's a lesson learned as well. A lot of times, like we talk about interaction design and those micro interactions, how they're all important and should be intentional, which is true. I do believe that. But at the same time, also, sometimes users don't care. Right. Right. Again, it's about the outcomes. Yep. If you can get them to a positive outcome, maybe a little bit of, I know we're not supposed to say this, but maybe a little stumbling along the way is okay. You have to determine is this a consumer app or is this a business processing app right where it's someone's job to punch in data they're going to have a higher threshold for for things being wrong than the consumer side is going to or is it some other critical application where errors can't happen you know, you're right. launching rockets to mars or something hopefully we don't work on those no no i I'm that. not really interested in, in projects where there's zero tolerance for error. <laughs> I, I like, I like the projects that are, you know, if we're in the one to 3% tolerance for error, I'm okay. I'm okay. Right. I can still sleep at night. Is anyone going to die by using this? No. Okay. I'm in. Especially me. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not going to come back to me. Is it? No. Okay. <laughs> Ship it. Do we have a uh, rosy conclusion or was that it? No. I don't think we have a rosy conclusion. And I think yeah. my inclination is that we're often never going to have a rosy conclusion because what we apply to all our projects is a process, not deliverables, not outcomes. It's, it's the process we go through to get to deliverables and outcomes. And those are often unknown when we start. And similarly, there is no one solution to all the problems. 
So right. to your point, like it's a process and there's no magic wand. <laughs> quite right. That. No, that, that works. That works. <laughs> See, see our episode on it depends right <laughs> it's our episode on on magic <laughs> on, see our episode on magic wands how to buy them how to it's use a long them. day people long day yeah all right well thanks for watching and subscribe <laughs> uh, are yeah. we youtubing correctly <laughs>